Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. If you prefer to not be recorded and distributed, please go to the LinkedIn Live link I've just placed in the chat room. Uh, again, by entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Vienna Live with Simeon Moore and other third parties. This show thrives on participant contributions, and all participants are encouraged to actively participate in this webinar by asking questions and making comments. To do so, please write in the chat room or turn on your microphone to say hi. We'll be delighted to include your perspective in the conversation. Tonight, our featured guest is Professor Rochelle L. Johnson, Chair of Environmental Studies at the College of Idaho, President of the Henry David Thoreau Society, and a leading scholar in the field of environmental humanities. Rochelle, welcome. Thank you so much, Simeon. It's so, great to be here again. And I want to say thanks, too, um, for adjusting the time of your show so that you can accommodate my Idahoness. I appreciate that. And hi to the a, LinkedIn audience, too. So a pleasure and a privilege, Rochelle. So, Rochelle, when I was growing up, I remember well the conversation about the climate that was happening was about acid rain. It was about um, Arbor Day and planting trees and how... Uh, uh, bad it was to cut down trees. Tell us, what was the conversation happening uh, when you were growing up? Honestly, I remember very little conversation, Simeon. You're younger than I am. So the acid rain thing um, was definitely a part of my life uh, and a concern. But there was also celebration about you know, concerns about emissions. And we made changes to uh, change greenhouse gas emissions um, early on. And then we stopped. Um, and so there wasn't much conversation. I had the real uh, privilege and luxury of spending every summer in New Hampshire, as I mentioned last time I was on your show. Um, and feeling like the world was full, rich with forests and ponds and, and healthy ecosystems. So I was vaguely aware as a, as a kid of environmental challenges, but, but not very informed. Um, it wasn't until I was a, a college student, really, that I began to understand um, that the environment had been changing drastically over decades and uh, centuries in this country in particular and um, became really concerned and took my love and my experience of the richness of the natural world and focused my studies there. Okay, so it was pretty much only when you were taking specific courses that addressed the environment that you really had an idea of what was going on, is that right? Yes, but it was also a vague notion um, that, that the landscape had changed so drastically in such a, sh a relatively short time that uh, Euro-American settlement here had utterly <laughs> transformed most of the um, botany, especially most of the plant life of this of this nation, and uh, that was that was alarming to me to learn that. I think I think actually that. Um, that that's still probably a little known fact that especially for me here in the West, much of what I see is is not native. And sometimes I wonder if, if um, the majority of our population realizes that the landscapes that they're looking at in the American West are, are hardly original. Okay, so this brings us to our first round table. What is the climate situation today? So here we have um, this, support, uh, excuse me, the Climate Change 2023 Synthesis Report published by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, and they summarize in this report that, quote, human activities, principally through emissions of greenhouse gases, have unequivocally caused global warming with global surface temperature reaching 1.1 degrees Celsius above 1850 to 1900 in 2011 to 2020. 
Global greenhouse gas emissions have continued to increase with unequal historical and ongoing contributions arising from unsustainable energy use, land use, and land use change. Lifestyles and patterns of consumption and production across regions between and within countries and among individuals. And it notes in parentheses that the authors have high confidence. They continue... The second takeaway is, quote, widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere, and biosphere have occurred. Human-caused climate change is already affecting many weather and climate extremes in every region across the globe. This has led to widespread, widespread adverse impacts and related losses and damages to nature and people. Again, they have high confidence in that statement. Vulnerable communities who have historically contributed the least to current climate change are disproportionately affected, again, with high confidence, end quote. Rochelle, you are the chair of environmental studies. What do incoming students and other faculty members think about the environmental situation? Well, the IPCC report, grim as it is, um, is, is a real touchstone in our environmental studies department. Um, our students read large sections of it. And in fact, as I'll say in a minute, we, we actually have all of our students um, at the college, not just environmental studies students, read um, a section of that IPCC report. So that report, as probably uh, many of you are aware, is updated regularly and compiled by um, a massive team of hundreds of international scientists. Um, at, at the College of Idaho, among the faculty, to address that in particular, I, I don't think there's um, any uh, any debate about whether climate change is quote unquote real. Um, there's a wonderful article for any of you looking for such a resource that we have our first year students read by Naomi Oreskes, and it's called The Scientific Consensus on Climate Change, How We Know We're Not Wrong. It's a, it's a very powerful article. Um, so yeah, among the faculty, uh, climate change is just a given. And interestingly, climate change has affected every single discipline in the academy. So at colleges and universities now, we have scholars working on climate change from every disciplinary angle. So philosophers are concerned about climate change. Psychologists are certainly concerned about climate change with increases in uh, climate anxiety and climate grief um, and the depression and anxiety generally in our culture that are accompanying those that phenomenon um, in young people. We can talk about that also. And uh, certainly historians are interested in climate grief, uh, climate um, issues, tracing uh, climate migration, plants and animals as they're moving. That is a scientific sphere. So in, in every discipline, politics, economics, there is work being done related to climate change. And that's partly why, um, to jump just a little bit, Simeon, that's partly why the college made a decision to focus our first year seminar program. So this is a course that all first year students take regardless of intended major. We focus it on climate justice. So um, we focus it on the topic of climate. And that was a decision made across the faculty because everybody has uh, a knowledge base about climate change. Everybody has resources they can turn to, no matter their discipline, on how knowledge is changing because of the climate's condition. Um, so that's it's kind of a, a wandering answer, but our, our faculty feels very strongly about the, the issue in the sense that it, it's transforming every aspect of life and of knowing. Wow. And Rochelle, just um, to give us a, a little bit of a larger perspective too. So as you said, in the academy, everyone is uh, fully invested in 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 that perspective what about then i remember of course uh, back in 2006 when al gore made the inconvenient truth movie then it was seen as on the 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 right side of the political spectrum people were saying no that's not the case that's or you know they were largely denying it now of, uh, of course the right uh, isn't really interested i i guess they're not interested in that anymore but still you have some companies uh, like the coal lobby or the gas lobby or um, those companies. I imagine that they're still doing what they call greenwashing or they're somehow trying to uh, uh, influence this conversation. Do you know 
much about those perspectives? Do some of your students still come and say, well, you know, this is global warming or, or changing in the atmospheres have, have happened throughout history. You know, this is nothing new. Yeah, I teach in Idaho and that says a lot. Um, what it says uh, is is that the politics lean um, pretty strongly conservative. And so we do receive at the College of Idaho a fair number of students who are from households in which climate change has never been discussed or it has been disparaged as, um, as made up or exaggerated um, or yes, as some natural thing that happens and now being misattributed to, um, to human causes. So uh, yeah, I encounter that. And I've had to develop strategies over time for, for talking to students about a subject that they sometimes don't believe in or um, more concerning to me, frankly, is that they feel deeply uncomfortable talking about, that they feel like they're turning against their own families by reading and talking about a subject. And I, I feel a lot of compassion for that. Um, so uh, I, I'll, I guess I'll talk about just a couple of strategies I use. One is that we do read things like the IPCC report and the Naomi uh, Oreskes piece that I mentioned, um, and, and of course, a lot of other things. And the students often feel barraged by what, what they think of as um, left-leaning representations of climate. But what, what I talk to them about is how at colleges and universities, we are very careful to rely on the conveyance of knowledge that is verified. We work with knowledge um, with publications that are vetted, that are peer reviewed, um, not, not that are um, questionable in their origin or in their accuracy. So I tell them that's why we're reading what we're reading because this is the material that has been vetted, that has been peer reviewed, that, that we do know um, based on hundreds of, of scientists understanding thousands, <laughs> tens of thousands around the world. Um, that's how, that's why we're, we're teaching this. And then personally, I've had to do something that, that sometimes feels a little um, coy, uh, a little uncomfortable to me, but, but that I think ultimately serves the students better. And that is to say that just as in geology class or in politics class, we don't question, uh, it's not our position to judge whether something is true or false until we're experts in it, until we know something about it. And I stress my own position and I'll say, you know, I was never in a position to be say an authority on Henry David Thoreau until I had my PhD, until I had studied many years after that, until I had taught this material a lot. And I'm no expert on climate change. So I position myself as like them. I'm no expert either. We're all learning, but we're not informed enough to say whether it's right or wrong. For that, we have to trust the experts or at least begin to um, acquire some basic knowledge before we can form judgments. So I sort of avert that. And, um, and then we do talk directly sometimes about talking with family members um, about reading material that they're uncomfortable with. And, um, and that, that can be hard, but most of them are actually extremely grateful to have a chance to read and talk about a topic that they know is in the air and in the ground and in their bones. They know that and they're really grateful for a chance to talk about it, even if a little resistant, some of them, not all of them. Yeah, it seems that those topics, uh, those are the most exciting ones that are the touchiest ones. So <laughs> moving on, tell us about the environmental studies program at the College of Idaho. You said that now all incoming students are uh, have to take some courses at the beginning. So I just want to read a little bit about it. Rochelle, the quote, the environmental studies program at the College of Idaho offers students an education in the complex relationship among natural systems and human cultures. The interdisciplinary program encourages students to question their own cultural and environmental attitudes and examine these values in their lives and work. The program prepares students to think critically obtain and analyze data and speak and write effectively about the environment 
while also providing leadership in helping their communities address environmental issues, end quote. Why is it so important that students take environmental studies? Hmm. Well, the, the, um, the course I mentioned that all of the students at the college take is called our first year seminar. So that's not actually in our environmental studies department. Um, but what you're scrolling through now are the, the many uh, programs that we do offer through our department. So we have the major, but we also have several minors. And then we have specializations. Um, and there's also a conservation specialization, which isn't showing up here because of vagaries of how websites are divided. And that conservation biology specialization is our most uh, popular one. Um, in any case, the, the environmental studies program offers students a, a truly interdisciplinary education. As environmental studies majors, our students are um, deeply versed in the sciences and in a range of sciences. They're studying environmental science, they're studying biology, they may study geology, they may study chemistry, they may study physics. And they're also studying um, ethics and environmental philosophy. They're studying environmental literary history. Um, that is the history of environmental thought and how we've expressed that, uh, mostly in this country, but also around the world. And they're studying um, courses in the social sciences. So that might be human geography or uh, policy and politics. So we believe uh, in our environmental studies program in a, in a really deeply interdisciplinary program. And, and I, and I want to just say that what you're sharing right now and what I'm saying is not, um, is not just the product of me. There have been a lot of people who've been involved in developing that program and in ensuring its interdisciplinarity. Wow. And Rochelle, tell us a little bit, maybe a story or two about what students have been taking away from this. Have any of them come to you and said, oh, I had no idea or, uh, you know, tell, tell, tell us about that. Well, I guess I'll talk about a couple of aspects of the curriculum that um, that might surprise students. Um, or, or others, I think that our students are continually surprised at how deeply integrated issues of human justice are with issues of uh, environmental challenge. So we work really hard in many of our courses to talk about um, the history of uh, humanity as it relates to the history of environmental change. And so our students learn a lot about settler colonialism and how Euro-American settlement of uh, this continent, uh, North America, did profound and extreme uh, damage to, to so many cultures and to so many peoples, um, and how we live with the repercussions of that now and those continued injustices. So um, that's, that's one thing that our students um, really value learning about, and I think they're surprised because a lot of them come in thinking um, environmental science. And then as soon as they encounter the breadth that is environmental studies, they realize it's not just about the, the, um, the rocks and the, and the plants and the animals uh, and even the landscape formations. It's, it's also about humanity. Um, and then I guess another story I'll share is um, rel relates to our environmental studies capstone class. So this is a course that all students who are majoring in environmental studies take in their last semester. And they write a senior thesis, but they write a senior thesis that's related to a theme. So all of them are approaching the same theme in some way. Now their backgrounds as environmental studies majors may emphasize the sciences or the social sciences or even the humanities a little bit more than the other students. So they can tailor their senior thesis within the theme they're pursuing to their interests. But we share all of those theses with the community. We, we hold a public forum and um, oftentimes people from the city will come, uh, members of the public will come, of course families come if they're in the area. But that turns into a public event where the students are sharing their knowledge. And I think again and again each year they're surprised at how valuable their knowledge is to, to the public, to the wider world. Um, that what they've accomplished in four years is already seen as, as really germane. And I think they're also surprised at how well it's received in, in what is an extraordinarily um, conservative county where our college is. Wow. So you touched on, you said something said climate justice. 
Tell us a little bit about uh, the ethics of, of uh, what, what does that mean, climate justice? Because when you talk about justice, I think immediately, oh, that's something that only happens between two people. You know, I, I have rights, you have rights. Then it seems that you're saying, oh, well, the environment has rights. Tell us about this. Well, the notion of climate justice um, developed to try to capture the ways in which climate change, climate warming, severe weather events, fire, all of these things um, often impact the people in society who have the least amount of power, money, uh, and education. And so we see that climate change is very unjust. It's not, it, it, it doesn't behave um, in, an, in an equaling manner. So those who suffer the most, uh, suffer the most unfairly, often because they take the least part in creating climate change. So this is true globally, um, where the people who are suffering the most globally are suffering very unjustly because they've done the least to change the climate. So that's that's what climate justice refers to. Your question about um, the environment having rights, that is also a, a, a very rich field that people call environmental ethics or, um, or green ethics. And that's uh, environmental philosophy notions. That's the notion that um, aspects of the physical world that are not human, because we're of course aspects of the physical world. So non-human aspects of the physical world also have rights. And we see some uh, real strides being made in recognizing those rights, especially in New Zealand. Um, but that's that's happening around the world slowly. Wow. And uh, just to um, get more info about your students, so uh, when they come back to you and they say, or they write their papers, what what's most exciting to them? Is it, I mean, I can't imagine learning that of people in, you know, a far away, on a far away island, that they didn't earn this, that that's, that they can have that much empathy. I don't know, maybe that's the case, or maybe it's not, but tell us what, what, what gets them really excited about climate justice? Yeah, uh, well, I, two things pop to mind. Uh, one is that um, a surprising number of our students, maybe, you know, given what you just said, can relate to even the story of the, the flooded island, uh, although much of what we discuss is quite local. Um, the student body of the College of Idaho is extremely international and unusually so for such a small school. And we have students from 80 different countries. So it's almost always the case on this campus that people have a friend who lives close to some major event. Um, you know, when, when, we, when the war on Ukraine began, we our Ukrainian students <laughs> were leading things on campus. So um, we've, we've got a, a richness in that way that might be unusual. So people can connect to those things. Uh, and that's, that is exciting. But the other exciting thing has, has more to do um, actually with embracing the grief that they feel. So just uh, Monday and in, in yesterday in my class, um, we had a discussion about the notion of grief generally. Uh, I read a poem to them that was about grief and invited them to write. They frequently, we read a poem and then they write at the start of class and they know they can write about whatever they wanna write about. But I was interested in seeing where this discussion of grief took them in a course focused on climate injustice. The poem wasn't about climate grief, it was about grief. And they all took it straight to climate. And they talked about places they missed that were changing or memories they've had of uh, family members in certain places that they couldn't visit anymore because they were um, changed, gone in the students' words, which I thought was interesting. Some of these places are gone. And I thought, well, they're not gone, but they're changed, transformed, developed. Um, and, and the students were mourning that. And the reason I'm bringing this up when you ask me about an exciting moment is that the students in the course of the conversation turned that grief into empowerment and hope. Um, the students I actually was writing down some of what they were saying because it was it's just astounding. It's so amazing to work with young people. Um, one of the students said, you know, we're all collectively procrastinating. Isn't that an amazing statement? We're all collectively procrastinating dealing with this grief. And, and that led others to say, you know, there's a power 
one student, this is a quote, there's a power that comes from having nothing left to lose. And when they see the enormity of climate change and they begin to feel that, they don't give up. They say, okay, if this is where we are at the beginning of our lives, we, we want hope, we want meaning, we want connection. And so we're gonna make that. And so one of them said, it's as if my individuation has gone away. It's as if now it's not about me. It's about my connection to everyone and what we can do while I'm here. So this is all this first year course that that we've developed that um, is, you know, asking 18 year old students to grapple with some of this stuff. But boy, they're ready. They're ready to talk about it. And I think there's excitement in in that, that that freeing um, them to do that. Fantastic. Rochelle, so uh, as the last question, tell us, what do you hope the conversation about the climate, about um, the environment and all that, what do you hope that it's like in 100 years? Well, I could, to me, and I could answer that by saying, oh, I hope there's no problems and everything's wonderful, but it's not going to, it's not going to be the way it is. Um, but I do hope that people say, thank goodness, those people in the 2020s really took seriously climate change and th in, and thank goodness they did so much to try to do everything they could to make things better for us i guess that's what i hope fantastic let's see how we can stay in touch with rochelle uh, first of all excuse me this is if you are interested in the in intergovernmental panel on climate change it's very easy to get there it's ipcc.ch. So you can read all of those documents. And then to reach out to Rochelle, it's equally easy. It's rochellejohnson.com. And Rochelle, so people can uh, can reach out to you. If you. Is your email here? Yep. Right. If you scroll down to the bottom there, there's the email. There it is. So feel free to reach out to Rochelle with your questions or comments. It's rjohnson at collegeofidaho.edu. Thank you so very much to Professor Rochelle Johnson. Thank you. Great so, to see you all. Let's see what's coming up uh, next Wednesday. It is Yoni Koskela, Finland's Great Lake. When we think about Europe, more often than not, we think about its cities. But maybe that's because we have never been introduced to its extraordinary wilderness. Let's get started by getting to know Lake Saima, Finland's largest freshwater lake, and in Europe, second only to Sweden's Lake Vänern. The Joni, Joni Koskela, a biologist and nature conservationist, joins our show to intra, introduce us to Finland's Great Lake. As always, all information about upcoming shows may be found at www.simianmore.com. Again, that's Joni Koskela, Finland's Great Lake, next Wednesday. Again, thank you so very much to Professor Rochelle Johnson. Thank you very much to Victoria and Frederick Mulligan and Agnieszka and Benoit Rivole for the support of this show. Thank you also to Mary Schlesinger for the lovely Viennese Library you can see behind me. Most of all, thanks to you, our participants who make it all worthwhile from New London, New Hampshire in Caldwell, Idaho. Goodbye and see you next Wednesday. Thank you.